Even though in the natural, from what we can see, there's little signs of hope in this culture. But with God, there's always hope. As for what's happening in our culture, didn't the Word of God say it was going to happen? There is nothing to fear. If you are here in this hour, God chose you to be here in this hour. The rapture is Jesus coming from his Father's house in heaven to the earth to receive us to himself so he can take us back to the Father's house and marry us there. That's what we're waiting for. This is the next big event that's about to happen. And all the mayhem and everything that's happening in the world right now is exactly what the Bible said would happen right before the rapture. What we know is this, our redemption is drawing nigh. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come back and I expect to be here when Jesus comes back for the rapture. Don't stop living your life. Plan like Jesus isn't coming back for a hundred years, but live like he's coming back today. Well, good morning, y'all. We are not approaching the end times. We are living in the end of the end times. I'm telling you, we are that generation that Jesus prophesied about in Matthew 24 when he said that we would experience the birth pangs prior to his coming. We're living in a world where wickedness is ever increasing, where knowledge is rapidly multiplying by the minute. We're living in a world uh, that is really just getting darker and darker and darker. There's not only wars and rumors of wars, but there's just mass chaos happening all over the planet. And it lines up identically with what Jesus said uh, in the way that it would be in those last days prior to his return. So what does this mean for you and I as believers? We can't just live with our head in the sand. We can't just, just shrink back when we're called by Christ to live a life that is unashamed. We're, we, as Christians, as believers, we are to live and be the light for the world while they are living in darkness. People are looking for hope today. And as believers, we need to have, have uh, a, 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 be able to give an account and have an explanation for those who don't understand. For those who are living in the dark, they need a message of hope. And that message is Jesus is coming back for his spotless bride. And so the Tipping Point Conference and conferences like this, it equips you and I as believers. It gives us the information that we need so that we have more tools in our tool belt to be able to give an account and explain to others that don't understand, listen, it's okay. Listen, it, we don't need to live in fear, but we can be fearless because we belong to him and he's coming back and we're going to live and rule and reign with him forever. And so they need to hear this. And so we just want to encourage you guys, if you have not registered, we have only 20 tickets left. All right. When they're gone, they're gone. So today, jump on the website, mountainmoverschurch.org, or you can go to the Mountain Movers app and you can get registered there and then take a road trip with us down to Dallas. We're going to have a great time and we can't wait to see you there. Awesome. We hope you would join us for that conference. Well, this morning we are diving back in to the series we began last week called Why God, where we are answering those tough questions that plug us as humanity that we just contemplate and we just wonder to ourselves, is there really an answer? Well, this morning, I want to ask you a question. If you could ask God anything, when you think about this, if you could ask God anything and you knew you could get an answer. What would that question be? Anything. A few years ago, a poll was done, a scientific poll was taken by Lee Strobel and his organization. And the question asked of Americans was just that question. If you could ask God anything and you knew he would answer, what would your question be? There was an overwhelming response with the same question. And it was this. God, why do you allow pain and suffering in this world? God, why the pain and why the suffering? You know, if you live very long on this earth, you will experience pain. You will experience grief and sorrow and suffering. We've all lost a loved one way too early in life that we've wondered, God, why? Maybe you've walked through something tragic in your life. Maybe something as a child that you remember walking as your mom and dad were divorcing. Maybe you went through that ugly divorce yourself. Maybe you've walked through those moments where you're begging God to understand why the abuse happened, why the suffering, why the pain, why the infertility, why God? 
This morning, we want to try to take a very biblical approach to answer the question we've all asked, why do bad things happen to good people? So in order to answer this age old question, we need to rewind back to the book of Genesis. So let me hear your best rewind impersonation right now. Go ahead. That was interesting. <laughs> so back in Genesis, you know, maybe you've heard the story. If you've been in church any length of time, you've heard the story. God creates this beautiful garden on steroids, Eden, and he creates man and woman. And uh, we, we see here in Genesis chapter 15 and 17, it says, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Here's what we need to understand. Is that when God created the garden, when God created man and woman, he created the perfect life a life that was free from any pain and suffering. This was God's original intention. This was God's plan. God, being the standard laid out for humanity and expectation, he gave us a choice. He gave us a very beautiful gift that as believers, we need to always understand all of Christianity and our relationship with God, this all hinges on one thing, free will. God gave you and I the gift to choose. He didn't want robots. He didn't want people that would praise him because he told us to. He wanted a people who would choose him because we would choose to love him back. Did you know God loves you? Did you know that the God who created heaven and earth and all of the stars in the sky when you, and that's the beauty of living in the country, can I get an amen? When you look up at night, and the city folk just don't get it, when you look up at night and you can see every beautiful star in the sky, the constellations, and you can see just how far, God, do you go? Is there, is there any end to you? And there's not. He's infinite. And his love for you is bigger. I used to ask my kids when they were little, I'd say, how much does daddy love you? This big? Does daddy love you this big? How big does daddy love you? They're like, behind the back, big. Bigger than the whole university. <laughs> Because who knows what a universe is, right? When you're three. God, his love for you is so huge. And through his love, he established a life for you without pain and suffering. But we, humanity, chose to reject that love. When we chose to sin against God, we chose against his standard, and we chose thereby a life with pain and suffering because sin brings forth death. When we sinned against God, we ushered in the curse of sin and death, thereby welcoming in a world with pain and suffering. So when we ask that question, why pain and suffering? The reason we experience pain and suffering is because we live in a fallen world. Although we don't like that answer, and although we would like to go back to Adam and Eve and maybe say a thing or two to them. I remember AJ, our oldest, when he was about four, and Brad asked him to take the trash out. And he was on his way out to take it, grumbling the whole time. 
He did not like that chore. He did not like that chore. And he said, mm, I can't wait to get in that judge in line. He called it the, the judge, judge in line. In line. He we said, never taught him that, wait. but that, he came up with that on his right? own. He heard the us judge preaching. in line. He said, I can't wait to get in that judge in line. I'm just going to punch Adam right in the nose. Because <laughs> he understood as a little kid. Because he had to take out the trash. Adam and Eve are the cause of us having to work by the sweat of our brow. They're the ones who ushered it in. But honestly... If any one of us would have been in that place, we too we would have, done would have it too. probably blown it. You know, you've spent a day with you. You right? have done it too. <laughs> you know your thoughts. But still, the question we beg to have answered in our mind, but okay, there's evil in the world because of sin, but God, why but good still, people? Why? why, if somebody is really trying, if they're really, really good, God, they're the best person I know, why would a bad thing happen to a really good person. Well, I'm gonna tell you something this morning that you're probably not gonna like. So I'm gonna prep you for with that. You know, there's really not any of us who are good. Mm. That's the truth. You know, the prophet Jeremiah, he said it this way in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse nine, the heart talking about the human heart is deceitful above all else. Check this out. It's beyond cure. The human heart is deceitful. Romans 3 and 23 says it this way, for everyone has sinned. Who's everyone? That's all of us, all humanity who will ever walk and breathe on this planet. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. Now, I want you to think for a second about that word standard. We said God created the world. We see it in the book of Genesis. He's the authority. It was his standard. How many parents do we have in the room? If you're a parent online, just like type it in, okay? How many of you guys have a sibling? Raise your hand. How many of you guys fought with your siblings growing up? Okay, any hand not up that had a sibling? Don't you be lying in church, okay? Now listen. <laughs> We understand as kids growing up that our mom and our dad set a standard. I want you to think about this. When we were growing up, there were five of us siblings, two girls, three boys. And mom and dad raised us that we were to love one another, that we were to be kind to one another, that we were to treat one another the way you finish it, you would want to be treated. It's called the golden rule. You all know it. Your parents taught it to you. Well, I remember growing up and having these moments where we didn't quite measure up, where we weren't quite showing the love of God to our siblings. I remember one day in particular, my brother and I, my younger brother, who happens to run our AV team here, so he's here. You can give him a hard time. But he was following me and we were out in the yard and I'm not sure what I did, but all I remember is what he did, okay? I'm sure that whatever I did was not that bad enough like for marriage. this, right? Well, we are not talking about marriage. We're <laughs> off that series. I had to. I'm sorry, honey. But we were outside. I did something to cause him to lose his temper. And he picked up this red wuffle ball bat. You know what those kind are. You know the ones that Big, are skinny fat, here. Big, red ones. Big, fat oh, on the yeah. end. He grabbed that bat. He oh, took yeah. off chasing me across the yard. And I was headed straight for the house. You know why? Because mom was in the house. I knew if I could get in oh, the house, yeah. I was going to be safe. He was going to hit me with that sucker. So I'm headed in the house. I make it all the way to our front door. And our front door was a glass front door, all right? I opened that door, I made it right in time to let it slam behind slam me as I'm making door, it, did you? only to hear that red wolfle ball bat hit that glass door and mm. shatter, yeah. I turned around and I'm thinking, you're dead. He knew he was dead. In that What'd moment, you do? in that moment, <laughs> it didn't matter what I did, Mom. he was gonna die, all right? Of course, we broke, had broke the standard. That day, we faced the consequences as we did pretty much every day growing up, where we were lined up and our rear end was heated up. Why? Because we were parents. not treating <laughs> one another 
the way we wanted to be treated. You see, when God created the world, he created it with a standard that we as humanity can't live up to without Jesus. On our own, we are not good. On our own, we hurt one another. On our own, on our best day, there's days that we say and we do things unintentionally and even intentionally that hurt other people. I'm gonna give them a piece of my what? My mind. We let You've our mouth. You've done it too. I know. <laughs> but we say to ourselves, but if God was really a good God, yeah. and he really loved us, wouldn't he do something about this? Wouldn't he do something about the evil? Wouldn't he stop it? He did. He did. You see, the Bible tells us that although there was consequences for our sin, there are consequences as a child when we disobey the standard our parents set. Good parents set standards and enforce them and there's consequences. Yeah. God said there are consequences for your behavior. There's consequences for your sin, for not measuring up to my standard. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave my throne on high. I'm going to come to earth in the form of a baby. I'm going to live a perfect, sinless, spotless life. And I'm going to take your place and take the consequences that you should have been punished for. And I'm going to take them on myself. You see, the only person who ever walked this earth who was truly good, there was only one person, only one person who was perfect, only one person who measured up to God's standard, and that was who? Jesus. You know, you've heard it said before, if God was really good, if God was really good, he wouldn't let those things happen. Listen, God is good. He is really, really good. He paid the penalty for our sin. He took our place. And God really loves us. John 3, 16 says it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son that anyone Anyone who had ever broke his standard from the person who simply said something that hurt someone to the person who murdered someone or raped someone or abused someone, every heinous sin that would ever happen in this world. He looked at them and said, I love you and I created you with a purpose and I'll take your place. Verse 17 says, for God sent his son not into this world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. But again, he gives us that beautiful gift called free will. Everyone can choose Jesus, but everyone gets the choice. You see, we wonder, God, why the suffering? God, why the pain? And yet Jesus suffered. First Peter 3 and 18 says, Christ suffered for our sins once and for all, yet he never sinned. And you may be sitting here today and saying, you know, but I still, I still don't quite understand. And I'll tell you, there's been those moments in my own life when I just didn't quite understand, when I knew God could have done something different, when I knew he could have healed when he chose not to, when I knew he could have done something different. And I said, why God, why God? And yet it reminds me that on the cross, Jesus with his arms stretched out, do you know he said those very same words? Why, God? In the moment that our sins came upon his shoulders, God turned. Why? Because Isaiah says that sin separates us from God. As Jesus took the sins of all humanity upon himself, he cries out, God, my God, why? Because he was taking our place. You say today, where's the hope? Where's the hope in this message? Where's the hope in the fact that we're still gonna endure pain and suffering in this world? 
The hope is in Jesus. The hope is in the fact that this world is just temporary. This world is not our home. It's not the way God originally intended, but there is coming a day, the Bible says, when there will no longer be tears, there will no longer be pain, there will no longer be suffering, when God will bring a new heaven and a new earth and he will replace it, why? He's gonna bring it back to his original intention. In Revelation chapter 21, you can read about this. But I wanna read you only verse four, and it says this, Revelation 21 and four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. In this world, we're gonna face pain. In this world, we're gonna have trials. Jesus said, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. You know, the truth is, there is a place and time for all of us who are sealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, a time where we will experience no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more tears. And the reality is, we're just not quite there yet. Even though through free will, humanity chose a life with pain and suffering, the beauty of it all is because of what Jesus did, we can choose Christ. And when we choose Jesus, we choose a future blessed hope of the one that is to come the one who will part the skies, the one who will take his spotless bride and receive us unto himself and and lay before us, lay out a marriage supper of the lamb where we will be with him and eventually we will rule and reign with God. To say that, that, that God isn't good is the furthest thing from the truth. To, to, uh, it's, it's, un, it's, it's understandable to ask the question, why would a good God allow all of these horrible things to happen? Listen, whatever you're going through, don't think for one second that Jesus doesn't understand your suffering, that Jesus doesn't understand your pain. Whatever you might be going through, even now, as you're hearing this message, you're saying, Pastor, you don't have a clue what I'm going through in my life. I may not, but he does. Because when he was hanging on the cross, do you understand that he chose to leave his godness? He left heaven and became a man. He became human just like you and just like me. And when he was hanging on the cross like a sponge, he absorbed every measure of wickedness, every ounce of sin that would ever be committed against his glorious standard. He absorbed it and took it upon himself. The rape of children sexual immorality and perversion. He took upon himself anything and everything you can possibly imagine. Sickness and disease and chaos and turmoil, depression and anxiety, everything you can imagine that is evil and wicked and hurtful. He took it upon himself. There's nothing that you will ever experience in this life that Jesus didn't experience on the cross when his love was on full display for you. That is the goodness of the God we serve. He was crucified and gave his life so that we wouldn't have to die in our pain and suffering, but we could live and rule and reign with him. Do you understand? Because God is good. The pain and the suffering that we experience is temporary. Some of you may be fortunate in your life to to look back and say, man, God was really good to me in that moment. He healed me or he blessed me or he did this and he did that. And that's wonderful. But there's gonna be many of us that just experience a lot of pain. But the hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in him. 
Will God allow you to endure more than you can possibly handle in this life? Absolutely he will, but there is nothing you will ever go through that he can't handle. And he has promised that he will be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never turn his back on you. He'll never forget about you. God is with you through the good times and through the bad. God is faithful. He's walking through this life with you. You're not alone. When you have Jesus, you have everything. The question is, do you have him? Let's bow our heads today. I want to speak for a moment to the one who has not yet said yes to Jesus. Why choose a life of pain and suffering and sorrow and sickness? Why choose a life experiencing the fullness of the curse of sin? without calling upon the one who reversed the curse so that one day you could live a life without it. Jesus is your hope and he is knocking on your heart's door. Will you or will you not open the door and answer? He loves you. He gave his life for you. He is a good, good God. All your life he's been faithful. He's knocking on your heart's door even now. Will you receive him? You can do that by asking God to forgive you of your sins. We shared a scripture earlier that said, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God's standard. We've all fallen short. But he says, if you believe in him, if you admit that you're a sinner and you believe in him, you believe that through his death, burial and resurrection, that he is the son of God and he gives life confessing him as Lord of your life, you can, you can be saved. You can live. So would you make that decision today? We're going to pray this prayer as a church family. And as we do, I'd ask you to pray this with us and agree with us for those that would be receiving Christ right now. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the son of God. I confess him to be Lord of my life thank you, God, that you are with me, that you will never leave me. You'll never forget about me. You are a faithful God. You are a good God. In Jesus' name.